Hey guys, so if you got a Bible, open up with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. That's Emma Cowan. She's uh, our assistant um, director. I'm so grateful for she serves Hannah and blesses Hannah Wall, who is our children's director. And her and Kellen are the, one of the host homes for the community group. So if you want to come hang out with them, that's the house you want to go to. Well, this is a great text. Uh, we're going to have a chance to, to try to dig into this. But let me start off by telling you a, uh, a story. So when I was a teenager, I was playing a couple of pickup basketball games with my some friends and my family, and my dad was there. We were playing at this place called Pinal down the road, some sweet basketball courts back in the day. And so after two or three games, I realized I was just a complete dumpster fire as a basketball player. I, I had missed like virtually every shot that I had taken. And, you know, if you have ever played a sport with people that are competitive, they were just mocking me and ridiculing me because that's how it was. And um, I remember my father came to me and he said, hey, Daniel, because he's, he's a coach at heart, he said, if you would just get your elbow in a little bit and if you would stop shooting fadeaways, you might actually improve on your shooting. And being the very mature, teachable 14 or 15-year-old that I was, I said, Dad, I know how to shoot a basketball. I know what I'm doing. Stay in your lane. I didn't say stay in your lane, but that's functionally what I said to him. And so my dad was like, all right, fine. Keep shooting the way that you're shooting. And so I kept on playing, and sure enough, I didn't make a shot the rest of the games that we, we played. And, uh, and so my point is, is that in that moment, I had the opportunity to admit a weakness I had a chance to take responsibility and to have some self-awareness. But I didn't like that feeling. I didn't like admitting that I was doing something wrong. The truth is, uh, you really should never shoot with your elbow out in basketball if you don't know this. And to shoot a fadeaway, you have to be an incredible shooter. And I am not either of the, I'm just terrible at basketball. I'm there for hustle points, you know what I mean? And so the fact that he gave me this advice, it was the right advice, but I ignored it. Because I didn't like that feeling that I was doing something wrong made me feel vulnerable, if you will. And so I pushed back against it, and I challenged it really hard. And what's sad about that is I limited an opportunity for me to grow. I limited a capacity for me to be used by God in this sport that I I really loved a lot. And now God has a sense of humor, because that's what my kids do to me. They say, Dad, I know, I know. And I'm like, no, you don't. But that's just how life is sometimes. Um, The whole point of the text today is for Jesus to display his power. And he's going to display his power by healing a man that was born blind. But Jesus is going to leverage this man's like physical blindness to talk about spiritual blindness. He's going to speak into the fact that we don't like being weak. We don't like feeling like we don't have all the answers. And he's going to challenge that idea, particularly in the group of the Pharisees. So let's look at this text and let's begin to, to wrestle through it. So if you look at verse 1 through 5, um, he starts off by that kind of the focus of that is the disciples asking the question, who sinned? But before we get to that part, the, the text says, John says that this man was blind, but he was blind all the way back from the time he was born. Now, this is an important detail because there are other people that have physical ailments and disabilities that Jesus is healing all throughout the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, but this guy in particular seems to be the only one that his affliction has been all the way back from his, like, from being born into it. So in addition to that, this is, I think this is God's way of highlighting the power of Jesus in a unique way. It seems to be a bigger deal that you can heal somebody that's been blind all the way from birth than if somebody would have been blind shortly after that. Uh, the, kind of the, I've already used one basketball analogy, so let's just, you know, use another one. I grew up in the 90s, and in the 1990s there was the greatest commercial ever in all commercials, that had Michael Jordan and Larry Bird in it. Some of y'all might remember it. They're playing the game of horse. You, raise your hand if you remember this, this commercial. The seven of us, that's great. Uh, so in this, they're playing horse, and it starts off with them shooting jump shots, and then all of a sudden it gets a little more competitive because they're two of the greatest basketball players in the history of the NBA, and so then it's like, all right, I'm going to shoot it off the roof, and then it's like, I'm going to shoot it through the window, and then the next thing you know, they're shooting it like oh, down the freeway, off the freeway, through the window, and the whole point of the commercial is, is the more difficulty and you added on it, they would up the ante, and the more difficult the shot, the better basketball player that they would reveal they were. I kind of think that's the whole point of this guy being blind from birth. It's like this is another hurdle that if Jesus is even able to heal a blind guy, that's incredible. But to heal a blind guy from birth is even a bigger deal than that. And so his disciples look at this guy and they say, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? 
Now here is the problem with this question. It is sprinkled with a little bit of biblical truth. It's partially true, which makes it all the way true. But let me kind of like, let's wrestle with this, okay? So it is true that generally speaking, blindness and all sickness and all disease and all ailments and all pain, generally speaking, are the byproduct of sin. If you go all the way back to Genesis 3, the text says there that Adam and Eve sinned, and when they sinned, sin ruined everything in creation. It affected our relationships with one another. It affected our relationships with God. It affected our physical bodies, and it affected the physical earth. So in a theological sense, it's accurate that sin does cause all sickness and all pain. And one day, that's why we long for Jesus to come back. Because when Jesus returns or we go be with him, we're going to be in a place where there's no more like COVID or cancer or physical blindness. That's why we long for the coming of Christ. So that is generally true, but that's not how they mean it in a fancy theological scholarly way. In addition to that, it is a biblical principle that if you make sinful bad decisions, there are consequences for those decisions. You will reap what you sow. So if you're here and you're a teenager or you're a kid and you fail a test because you made a decision to not study for that test, that is your fault because you did not study for the test. That's not like, woe is me. That's like, you should have not played Fortnite the night before. You should have studied. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that, that's a principle in Scripture. If you make bad decisions, there's consequences for it. But that's not the way they mean it either. And like, a, like maybe this guy is, is God's dealing with him or disciplining him. That's, that's not how they mean it. It's my understanding that they mean this in a very legalistic way. You say, what's legalism? This is my very simple definition. Legalism in short is if I do good works, then God will bless me and he'll always be good to me. If I could add there, that means you believe or they believe that if I do good things, that guarantees that God's always going to be good to me. But the opposite of that is true. If I do sinful works, then God's going to do evil things to me. And I would add on to that, it guarantees that God's going to get you because you do sinful or bad things. And so as a result, you are the controller of your destiny. You can determine what your life is going to look like based on how awesome you are at obeying God's word. One commentator said it like this. A legalist operates under the assumption that people earn or keep God's favor through righteous deeds. So legalists begin to view themselves as deserving of certain blessings. So in other words, if I can earn God's favor by my good works, then the more good works I do, the more God becomes indebted to me. He must reward my good deeds with blessings. And if something bad happens to me, it must be because I did something wrong. So that's how they mean it. They mean it like something's gone awry because God's punishing them or he's being unkind to them because they've done something stupid or careless. Now, we know that they didn't do anything wrong, this guy or his parents, because Jesus explicitly says that in verse 3. Look at it with me. Jesus says it was not that this man sinned or his parents. It's got nothing to do with sin. There's another purpose in his pain. The purpose is that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, Jesus is very, very clear that this guy's affliction, his suffering, does not have to do with some sort of legalistic principle that this guy's affliction has a purpose and its purpose is that people would see the power and the glory of Jesus. And I just want to ask you a philosophical question. To me, there's a part of that that feels like that's not fair. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't know how old this guy is. Let's just assume he's past 25. Maybe he's even older. That means this guy has been blind his entire life. And in the first century, there was not Braille to read or handicapped parking spots or social programs to help people that were blind. You were guaranteed a life of destitute and poverty sitting with your hand out saying, somebody help me or I'm going to die. I have no food to eat. That's what it was like for a blind person in the first century. And this guy had to live his whole life like that. And for you and I as Americans, we're kind of like, well, that ain't right. Like he had to do all that for this moment where Jesus could display his power. That doesn't seem fair to us, but I think even the fact that I am prone, and maybe even you are prone to object to that, reveals something about my heart and your heart. That generally speaking, the vast majority of us hate trials and tribulations. We hate pain. Can we agree on that? Like who in here wants to be blind or somebody they love dearly to be blind? None of us want that. We probably wouldn't even wish that on some of our worst enemies. 
And so the truth is, we don't like pain and suffering. And so we're resistant to that. But what you find, at least in just this short narrative in this first part, is God leverages pain and suffering for purposes that are huge and important. And God is going to do that with this man's blindness. He's going to heal this man to display his power. So if we could make a simple like application to my life and to your life as I was studying this week, I think you and I as Christians need to be careful to never view pain and suffering as always being the byproduct of sinful decisions that we've made. We don't need to be legalistic at heart. And you know you're a legalist when you assume every trial and tribulation and affliction that you have is always guaranteed there because God's out to get you because you're not honoring him. Now let me just tell you why I am prone to view pain and suffering that way. This might not be you, but just to be transparent, this is why I do that. I like the feeling of being legalistic because it feeds into my desire to, to desire to be in control. Because when I face things like that are painful and difficult, they're completely out of my control, right? I can't heal blindness. I can't heal cancer. I can't heal other diseases and difficulties and ailments that people have. And that feeling when somebody I love or myself is going through that makes me feel like I can't fix it. And I like the feeling of control. So you know what I do? I believe a lie, like a legalist. I'll just go do a bunch of really good works and maybe God will do the thing that I'm demanding of him to do. See, the, you might not do that, but I'm telling you I am prone to do that. And I think if all of us are being honest, we at least do this every once in a while. See, here's the problem with that in my heart and your heart if we do that. When we do that, when we are facing something that's difficult, rather than fixing our eyes on Christ and his purposes in the pain, we fix it on ourselves. And we begin to miss the whole point of why we're going through a trial or a tribulation. We miss it. Because we don't like it, first of all. And second of all, we're prone to feel like we, we want it our way. And God has a purpose in this guy's pain. And so what we need to do instead of that is we need to diligently work to try and see the circumstances through God's perspective and God's lens. And here's the truth, y'all. God can and does heal people. And he displays his majesty and his glory and his power through that. But hear me, God is just as powerful and supernatural to give you what you need to sustain that pain that will not go away. Does that make sense? That when you lean into him, when everybody else would abandon him, that's supernatural strength that God is giving you when life is hard and painful. One of my favorite like, people in the history of the church is a woman by the name of Corey Ten Boone. She says this, she says that when a train goes through and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off the train. You sit still and you trust the engineer. So I think that's the major focus of this. This guy is hopeless and he has to trust the engineer, he has to trust Christ. And then we get to see the healing. That's verses 6 through verse 12. So here's what verse 6 says. Let me just read it again. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Now let me just say something out loud that hopefully you're, I mean, not hopefully, but I think you're thinking. That is a weird way for you and I to see somebody to be healed. Can we agree on that? We despise spit and the most disrespectful thing that you could do, at least in the world I grew up in, is to spit near me or on me. You know what I mean by that? That's like immediately we'll fight. <laughs> uh, and so when Jesus spits on the ground, it, for you and I, it's this kind of, strange way to be healed here's what's interesting two other times jesus miraculously heals people with a spit one other time was with a deaf man in mark 7 he actually takes the spit and he puts it on the dude's tongue you uh, and then the other side of it is he takes a, a guy that is blind that it wasn't blind from birth but another guy was blind and he uses spit to directly apply it to him to heal him so why did jesus spit in the ground and make clay well the short answer is we don't know the text doesn't tell us so let's speculate. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I used to have a professor in seminary who said the worst heresy that's preached from preachers and speculation and soapboxes. But, uh, but I think there's some like, interesting things to think about. Okay, So here's some suggestions to why Jesus spit in the ground and made clay and healed this way. But the first way is, is some people say that Jesus is not healing in the same way every time because we are prone to think we could just replicate it. And Jesus is doing it different ways to, to, to reveal that it's not the methodology, it's him that brings the healing. That's one cool answer. 
Another thing was, is it was a common practice in the first century that there are a few rabbis that taught that the firstborn of a father, that his saliva had the power to heal people. That was also a practice in the pagan society and culture that you and I, saliva is dirty. It's got germs. You know what I mean? What's the old saying? It's like it's dirtier than a dog's mouth. Your mouth is, you know? So it's like, that's what we say. But in the first century, there seemed to be this belief culturally that saliva could have healing power. Some have argued that this text is an allusion to Genesis chapter 2, where God takes up dirt out of the soil and he makes Adam out of it. He brings life out of the dirt. And so some people say that this is an allusion to that text and he's bringing life from that. It could be that he's making mud to just make the real Pharisees mad because he knows he's violating a rule that you can't make mud on the Sabbath. My two favorite ones that seem to make a lot of sense to me is he's spitting on the ground to appeal to the man's senses. He loves this man. And if this man has been blind from birth, then that means his hearing and his sense of touch are heightened. And so as Jesus is spitting in it, the guy's hearing it, and when he applies it to the guy's eyes, he can feel it. And this is Jesus' way of loving him well. It's also his way of doubling it down. Like, it's hard enough to see, but it's doubly hard if you put clay on your eyes. The truth is, we don't know, but here's what we do know. Jesus says, go to this pool and wash that mud off in that pool. And the text is very clear why he's going to the pool. Number one, John says that the pool means scent. John offers this important detail. Now, this is saying that John, John is saying that this man is being sent to the pool. But more importantly, John is saying that Jesus is the sent one. He is the promised Messiah. Second thing is, it's an affirmation of Isaiah chapter 8, verse 6. It's a fulfillment of a prophecy. Because this people has rejected the gentle flowing waters of Shaloa or Shalom, or however you want to word it. The idea is, is that there seems to be this correlation to the people of God rejecting him in the Old Testament and the Jewish people rejecting Christ in the New Testament. That Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy by sending this man to that pool. Third of all, the pool connects Jesus' miracle to the Feast of Tabernacles that we've been studying for like three or four weeks. The Feast of Tabernacles was that huge feast where they would bring that cup of water and they would bring it in as this like giant parade and festival. And it's in the midst of that cup of water from that pool that we found the words that we studied a couple of weeks ago. Chapter 7, verse 37 says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So all of that's connected to this pool. So the guy does exactly what Jesus tells him to do. He doesn't say, ew, <laughs> that's spitty mud you just put on my eyes. But he, he thanks the Lord and he goes and obeys Christ. And when he obeys Christ, he's miraculously healed. And I would just suggest to you, I don't know your heart. My guess would be you take your eyesight for granted. That'd be my guess. My guess would be you rarely get before God and say, God, I'm so grateful that I can see the colors on the seats and the color of this drape, the color of the pastor's shirt, and the color of the skies. We rarely just get on our knees and say, God, your mercies are new every day because I can see. And for this guy, I guarantee you he didn't take it for granted. Because the second he's able to see, he could see a blue sky. He could see that thing in the clouds, you guys know what I'm talking about, when the sun's behind it, and they're glowing like orange around the back of the clouds. He could see birds flying through the air for the first time, and everything that he saw, his brain would have no reference point for it, and it would be the first time he ever saw it in his whole life. I listened to this interview from two blind people on YouTube, because I'm a nerd, and I chase rabbit holes sometimes, and one woman had, was blind later in life, and another guy had been blind from birth, and the woman that was uh, later in life said that when she dreams, she can see things in her dreams because she has a reference point for sight. The blind guy from birth said, I've never seen anything in my life, not even in my dreams. Because my cortex of my brain doesn't even know what that would like, look like. And so the fact that this guy is able to see for the first time ever is glorious. It's a display of God's supernatural divine power through Christ. It's so significant that the people around him are blown away. See, he was a beggar. He sat at the same spot or at least different spots virtually every single day begging for money to survive. And many of the people around him are like, this is awesome because we know who that guy was. And now he's able to see. Other people were in denial. And this isn't like skeptical, you know. This is more like that's impossible because we passed this guy for a decade or more. And every time, this guy's never been able to see. He's the same guy, like last Tuesday, that was begging me for a denarii with his eyes closed because he didn't want to see or he couldn't see. And so they're blown away by this. And they say, how did this happen? 
And Jesus is the main character in every text. The second important character in the text is the blind guy. He's the coolest dude outside of Jesus in the text. Because here's what the blind guy says. He says, the man called Jesus in verse 7, made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. So let me just pause here for a second. I think we need to make a very important application. Y'all, it is very clear that Jesus is leveraging the physical blindness of this man to talk about spiritual blindness. If you get down towards the end of the chapter, verse 39, here's what it says. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you'd have no guilt. And now I say to you, <laughs> Your guilt remains which means you're blind. So the whole point of John chapter 9 is to display the power of Christ over physical blindness. But it's to ultimately point to the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees and every person that is alive. That Christ has come to save us. Every person that doesn't know Jesus, that Christ wants them to know him. He has died on the cross and he's risen from the dead in order that sinful people like you and I won't stay in darkness. Jesus is explicitly saying that to these Pharisees. He's saying, you're blind. And they're like, no, we're not. And he's like, well, if you're guilty, you are. And I can see you're guilty. And they're just in complete denial of it. Guys, I want to read a text to you. Look down, it's in 2 Corinthians 4. We should have it on the screen. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 4 says about the darkness that the world is in. It says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The whole point of reading that text is what the Bible teaches is everybody that's apart from Christ is in a spiritually dark place. They can't figure out the truth. They're hopeless. They have a problem that they can never fix themselves. And what that text says is the devil is devoted to keeping them in the darkness. And his methodology is to keep them from the glorious message of the gospel. The devil's simple plan is this. Keep them from hearing, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, so they'll be condemned and they'll go to hell. That's his plan. And what Jesus is saying in this passage is he has come to heal spiritual blindness. He has come to give salvation to anyone who would believe. And there's some of you in this room, you got saved later in life. Like maybe in your 20s or late teenage years or even recently. We got people in our church, they got, they've been saved like for like 10 seconds. Like they've just become Christians. And that idea of spiritual blindness is very distinguishable to you. You see it very clearly. Like you remember who you were 18 months ago. And you're like, I'm not that person anymore, Right? That there is this real change in you because God has changed you from the inside out. You no longer live in darkness. You live in the light of Christ, right? And it's very clear to you. And I would say most of us in this room, if you're a Christian, we have people we love that are still caught up in that darkness. And I think a very simple implication of this text is for us not to look at them with an arrogant, prideful attitude but for us to look at them with compassion and a desire to say they need Christ. And we preach Christ to them in order that they might believe and step out of the darkness into the light of Christ. And so I would just encourage you to never give up on that. That is hard work sharing the gospel with people we love, but it's worth it that people could be set free. The old song that we used to sing in children's church, right? Like this little light of mine, how's it go? I'm going to let it shine, right? Like, that should be the testimony of all of us. All right, so then we get to verses 13 through basically the end of the chapter. And we're not going to read it all because it's a lot. It's three interviews or investigations from the Pharisees. And so what I want to do is I just kind of want to show you where it is and I want to highlight and summarize it. And then we'll come back at the very end and hopefully apply some things for how we live. Interrogation number one, verses 13 through 17. Those neighbors who knew the blind man was healed, they bring the neighbors to the Pharisees. Now this is important. 
They, I don't think that they are doing it maliciously. Like, gotcha, now we're gonna like, get you in trouble. I think this is why they're doing it. We're not as spiritually mature as these religious leaders, and we don't understand what's happening. Help us understand what's happening. That's how their heart is. And so they bring them to the religious leaders, and guess what the religious leaders don't care about? Figuring out what's happening. <laughs> All they care about is condemning Jesus. And so then they, they're like, all right, they bring in the Pharisees, bring in the blind guy. And they say, what happened? So he tells them the same story as he told before. There's a guy named Jesus, he put mud on my eyes, and he miraculously healed me. And then the text says in this section that a great debate arises amongst the people. There's one group of people who say, there is this rule that we have in our congregation that you're not allowed to make clay on the Sabbath. And Jesus broke that rule, therefore he's a sinner, therefore God can't use him because he's a sinner. Then there's another group of Pharisees who say, I hear you, that dude was blind, and now he sees. So you're telling me God doesn't use sinners, but I'm looking at a dude that seemed to be used by God. By the way, that's the heart of a legalist, that God can't use sinners. And what you realize is God only uses sinners. He doesn't use anybody that's not a sinner because that person doesn't exist. Does that make sense? And so then they just basically say, ah, that's not enough evidence. Let's get more evidence. So they bring interrogation number two. They bring in the blind guy's parents. They look at the blind guy's parents in verses 18 through 23, and they say, are you guys really sure that this guy's been blind from birth? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're sure that he's been blind from birth. They're trying to make sure that all the stories line up, and the more questions they ask, the more they realize that the stories do line up. That it seems like this guy really was blind from birth and he really was miraculously healed. So then the Pharisees begin to press on the parents. They begin to say, uh, like, tell us what you think of this Jesus. And the parents, weirdly, are passive. Like their son was just miraculously healed by Jesus. You think that would like give them affections for Jesus, but they're passive. They're passive and they say, we're gonna stay out of that you need to go ask our son because he's the one that was healed. And then John gives us a detail to why they were passive. They were passive because the religious leaders were threatening that if anybody liked Jesus, they'd get kicked out of the church. And they're like, this is my church, my synagogue. I'm not gonna get kicked out, so I'm gonna be passive in that. Now, I'm not saying it's right that they were passive, but you can kind of understand how evil it is for these religious leaders to wield their power in that way. So they, they couldn't get Jesus then, so then they, interrogation number three is they bring Jesus back in, and I'm sorry, they bring this blind guy back in a third time. And they say, tell us again what happened. He tells them the same thing. And in my version, my like paraphrase, this is what they, the blind guy says. I don't know what you guys are asking. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And they press him, and they challenge him, and they try to like get and manipulate him and finally, this blind guy boldly stands up to all these religious leaders. And he looks at them, and in my own like paraphrase of it, he's like, you don't even really care if it happened or not. You don't care about the details. You don't care about the data. You don't care about the facts. You've already made your mind up about Jesus. You guys ever got in an argument with somebody, and you can't reason with them? You guys ever, I'm sure that's never happened to one or two of us. But like, when you get in a conversation like that, it's like, I'll tell you what, Proverbs says, don't answer a fool in their folly, you join them in their foolishness, so we just need to not talk about it. Generally speaking, social media is the realm where you have those kinds of conversations, you know? It's like they're just waiting for you to shut up so that they could make their point to prove you wrong. That's what they're doing, and so the guy's like, I'm out. And then the blind guy has a gotcha moment, which is like, like if you like debating, I don't love debating or arguing, but this, that some people do, and he has this moment where he catches them in like a contradiction. Here's what he says. He says, you guys have always preached that God does not use people who sin regularly. That God refuses to use people who are sinners, whose allegiance is to the flesh. And the blind guy goes, but Jesus was used by God to heal me. Therefore, I know he's not a sinner. Therefore, he must be something different than what we are as human beings. It's, it's this blind guy's way of proclaiming the messiahship of Jesus to these religious leaders. See, what he did in that moment is he revealed holes in the way that they thought. He revealed problems with their hypocritical structures and ideologies. The blind guy, 
Like not some theologian, the dude that's been sitting on the side of the street with his hand out. And here's what they say back. They say, you were born in utter sin. Would you teach us? And they cast him out. Guys, I want you to sense the condescending attitude and tone that they have towards this blind man. And I don't know about you, if you've ever had somebody speak to you as if you were below them and they were up here, it is literally like one of the most painful things that you could go through. It's so disrespectful to speak to people like that. And they basically look at him and say, you're a blind guy. You don't have any degrees. You don't have any prestige. You don't have any power of influence. You have no authority. You're a nobody. Who are you to tell us about theology? And the irony is, the blind guy's one, like 100% right. He's totally right, and they're completely wrong, but they're allegiant to their way. They think they know everything. The way I thought I knew everything when I was playing basketball, saying, Dad, I know how to shoot. Mind your own business. And here's my favorite part of the text. I want you to see it. I, don't have it in, I wish I would have put it in the slides, but I didn't. It's my fault. Look at verse 35 if you actually have your Bible. Verse 35, right after they cast him out, the text says, Jesus heard they had cast him out and having found him, he said. So Jesus hears about the way they mistreat this blind guy and the first thing he does is he goes and he finds that guy to love him and care for him and restore him. Because Jesus deeply cares for this man. He cares for you and I. And when religious, and dare I say church people, sin against us, that's not always Christ. And Christ has a way of clarifying things and loving us when people do us wrong. And so Jesus finds this man, and he says, do you want to follow me? And eventually the blind guy says, you're the son of God. And then the text says he worshipped him, which I imagine he fell on his face, face, and he worshipped Christ in that moment. So I'm going to ask James and his team to come back up, and I want us to wrestle with an, a central idea in this, in this text, okay? We're almost done. To me, when I study this text, there's two types of people, okay? There's person number one, that rejects Jesus. They reject Christ in spite of all of the evidence, all of the things that would indicate that Christ is worthy to be praised. Like, to these Pharisees, it didn't matter that this guy was blind from birth. It didn't matter that people who knew him personally and his parents all testified that he was, none of that mattered. They were going to reject Christ. Then there's a second person that worships Christ. That's the blind guy. When he encounters the power and the love and the majesty of Jesus, he falls on his face and he worships Christ and he is eternally saved. He guarantees his place in the kingdom because he believes the gospel and he trusts Christ. Like the idea of worship is he attributes the worthiness that God is worthy of, that deserves. And here's the question I want you and I to wrestle with this morning. What is the difference between group one who rejects Jesus and group two that worships Jesus? Like, what's the difference between the highly religious, educated scholars and the blind guy? And I think the answer is simple. There's one thing, the difference between those two people. You know what it is? One person knows they are blind and the other one denies it. And so it seems to me an implication of this text is to be in a relationship with the Lord implies that we admit our blindness. And when you and I are willing to admit that we are spiritually blind, that we don't have all the answers, then that is the foundation or the soil by in which we believe the gospel. The way I thought about it was like, you can chop up religion however you want, but the message of Christ is you and I are a bunch of beggars with our hands out. Saying, God, I'm nothing unless you show me mercy. Would you give me mercy? I've tried everything in this life to satisfy the God-shaped hole in my heart, and I can't fill it. But you can, Lord. I'm blind. Would you let me see? 
And when you and I are willing to admit our spiritual blindness and our shortcomings and our sin before a righteous God, guess what you find out? God loves sinners. That he loved us so much that he sent his only one begotten son to die on a cross for you and I in order that we won't be condemned, but we'll have eternal life. This is the message of the gospel. This is what it's all about, which is why you and I as Christians should see our great need for Christ. And you never grow past that. You grow deeper in that. Charles Spurgeon, my favorite, one of my favorite pastors, he says this, it's not our littleness that hinders Christ, but our bigness. It's not our weakness that hinders Christ, it's our strength. It's not our darkness that hinders Christ, it's our supposed light that holds back his hand. Do you see what Spurgeon's saying? The issue for you and I is not that we're sinful and we're stupid and we rebel and we got a track record of being careless and dumb and sinning against God. The issue with you and I is we want to believe the lie that we don't need him. We can fix our problems ourselves. But the foundation of knowing Christ is falling on our face and worshiping him and realizing we're nothing without him. So I'm asking you, have you experienced that before? Or maybe you are a Christian and you know the Lord and you've gotten away from that. You've kind of started believing like a legalistic thing that you're awesome. And you need to get back to the foundations of the gospel. So I'm going to close us in prayer and we're going to have a chance to close out singing. Singing a song that is centered on that glorious message of Jesus. So Lord, we love you because your word says that you first loved us. And would you help us as believers to have deep roots in this gospel? I pray for people here that may be blind and not know it, that you might use this text to illuminate their hearts and their minds to their great need to know you. Would you save them even as I speak? And I pray for all of our loved ones that are living in darkness that don't know you. God, I pray that you'd save them too, that this work would be done in such a way that we would be able to celebrate how awesome and glorious you truly are. So I pray for this closing out time, God. Would you minister to us through your spirit as we sing and we end uh, the time in the word? And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen.